Think for a minute about your walk with God. Are you getting stronger in your faith and better equipped, or does it seem like you're stalling out? What's the trajectory? Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg asks each of us to consider our spiritual growth and the dangers of allowing our faith to grow cold. We're in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, with a message titled, Slowing or Growing? The encouragement which the writer has just delivered to his readers is on the basis not simply of gracious words, but is largely on the basis of good theology. And indeed, every lasting encouragement which is to be ours on the journey of faith is encouragement which emerges from solid theology. Superficial responses to the circumstances of our lives will sustain us for only a very short period of time. And the great truths of the fact of the high priesthood of the Lord Jesus and the deity of Christ, the wonder of who he is and all that he has done, are the solid theological underpinnings upon which our Christian faith is built. And so the writer, in addressing this, before he proceeds with what he has identified as this uh, issue of the priesthood of Melchizedek in uh, chapter 5 and verse 10, to which he's going to return uh, in chapter 7. Before he deals with this, he takes a purposeful pause. And between the 11th verse of chapter 5 and the 13th verse of chapter 6, he deals with three matters of pastoral concern. And they are, first of all, the problem of spiritual infancy. Then he identifies the pathway to spiritual maturity— And then he tackles the issue, or the peril, of spiritual apostasy. And this matter of the apostasy passages of Hebrews is a grave and pressing issue, has caused heartache to many, and to it we're going to come. But until we uh, deal first with these initial aspects of infancy and maturity, uh, we need to wait. He says in verse 12, "'Though by this time you ought to be teachers,' You need somebody to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Now, this is a quite graphic picture. If you imagine going into a restaurant somewhere in the city and walking in and looking around and discovering that everybody in there is doing nothing else other than drinking milk. And worse still, they are all drinking it out of large baby bottles— Gentlemen in suits and ladies in dresses and ties and teenagers, the whole group, they're all suckling out of these baby bottles. You'd have to conclude that there was something severely wrong with the group, and, uh, or that they were just a particularly strange society of milk drinkers or something, but we would have grave cause for concern. In the same way, to come upon a congregation of God's people who ought by this time to be advancing in the things of biblical theology, having moved beyond the elementary instructions of basic Christianity, to to find them all sitting, as it were, with big bottles of spiritual milk sitting around in their diapers— it's a graphic picture if you imagine this whole congregation sitting in nappies— and sucking on uh, milk bottles. If you imagine that for a moment, you say, what a bizarre thought. That would simply be a graphic portrayal of the condition which he identifies in the lives of those to whom he writes. By this time, he says, you folks should have become teachers, but you yourselves need somebody to teach you the ABCs all over again. Now, if you allow your eyes to look at the verses, you will see that the source of their difficulty doesn't reside in the complexity of the subject matter, nor does it rest in the inability of the writer to explain the matter. But the reason for their infancy and their continued babyhood is on account of the fact that they are, at the end of verse 11, in the phrase, slow to learn. Slow to learn. This word was used contemporaneously in the writer's day— to describe the numbed limbs of a sick lion. 
so that in seeing the lion unable to stand up as the king of the jungle, unable to put himself up on his paws and move about with freedom, was an indication of his sickness. And the word that was used there to describe the condition in his legs was this very same word. It's the same word that is used in the 12th verse of chapter 6, and there it is translated lazy. We do not want you to become lazy. It's the same word. We do not want you to be slow to learn, but instead to imitate those who through faith and patience receive what has been promised. It's not that these individuals were good souls who were listening carefully, who were trying hard to grasp what was being said, and were simply having difficulty. If that were the case, we would not expect the writer to speak to them as he does. Those of you who are teachers here today know that there is a great difference in your mind and in your approach to teaching between dealing with somebody who frankly has a total disinterest in the subject and dealing with an individual who is listening carefully, trying hard to grasp what's being said, and yet having difficulty in assimilating the information. The good teacher will work with that individual in hoping to advance them from where they are to where they might be. So we ought not to think that he is being hard on those who were trying to do their best. That's not the picture. He is being hard on those who should have been eagerly receiving the truth, but had developed a couldn't-care-less approach to the instruction. They had become, in part, professional listeners— They had become the kind of individuals, like people on aircraft, who when they ask you to take out the flight instructions and the safety instructions, flat out ignore it, because we say, I know all that. But every time that I refuse to take it out, in the back of my mind, I say to myself, if I ever had to get this jolly thing from under the seat, I don't know if I could grab it, and I don't know if I would have it the right way around, and I wouldn't know when to suck and when to blow on that jolly whistle thing. But you're so smart, so smug, hey, let old Mrs. So-and-so in 13F, let her read that stuff, and I'll check with her if it starts to go down. But for me... I'm okay. That's the picture of these individuals. The Word of God comes to them, and they have adopted a position of mental listlessness. They don't really pay attention, therefore they don't understand, and because they don't understand, they don't feel the impact of the truth. When you see little children being fed, and when you recall feeding your own little children, those of us who now have our children beyond the stages of uh, hand feeding— You remember those circumstances well. I see it around me in restaurants all the time, how the baby is fastened into the little seat and gets the plastic thing around their sorry neck that chafes their neck half the time. And then out comes the little bottle or whatever it is, and and the spoon goes in, and the mouth fastens closed. And then it involves uh, ingenuity on the part of the feeder. And so you have all of this the flying spoon routine, you know? So, woo, here comes, here comes the airplane, woo, all that nonsense. You know that stuff? And the kid's like, hey, don't give me the airplane stuff. We did that last week. I don't care. I'm not interested in this. Come on, we're going to bring the ship into the harbor. <laughs> now, we did the ship thing Friday. We're not, the ship thing's not going to work. I don't care. And so what happens to a congregation who refuse to absorb the Word of God as it's given to them? What happens to a lot of pastors and teachers is that they start to try and present the food, as it were, on roller skates. Or they start to bring it in. Come on, here comes the airplane. Come on now, open up. I've got to get it in you somehow. I've got to think of a clever way to come at it. I have to come at an angle with it, because after all, they don't really want it. And so that's why when you go to churches, all this paraphernalia going on, because you've got a big bunch of babies who are sitting there with their bottles, never advancing. And consequently, the feeder has to get dramatic and creative in seeking to force feed them. 
The same kind of carelessness and indifference to food is that which is expressed by many of a husband whose wife goes to see her mother for a few days and leaves behind all the careful instructions on the refrigerator door and all the prepackaged meals in the requisite places with the identifiable breakfast, lunch, dinner thing on it, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, only to come home and find out when she opens the refrigerator door that everything is exactly as she left it. Why? Because he said he couldn't really be bothered. And she says, what? You only had to reach your sorry hand in here, pull it out, put it in here, take it out, put it down here, and eat it. And you couldn't be bothered? That's right. I couldn't be bothered. Well, then you couldn't have much of an appetite. I guess not. We have much to say about this. It's hard to explain to you because you're too lazy, he says. You started out paying attention. In the beginning, your minds were focused, your hearts were stirred, but now so much of what you hear is to you nothing more than routine. I say to you again again, loved ones, that if you find yourself listening to the good news of the gospel being proclaimed and saying in your mind, saying, oh, I know that stuff. I can switch off for this. You're in danger, and so am I. Because those who love the gospel and love the word of God will love to be stirred by its truth all over again. And when for us the sound of God's word, the instruction of scripture, becomes to us nothing more than a dull routine to which we respond with mental listlessness, then verses 11, 12, and 13 of Hebrews 5 come to hit us square in the face. And such failure means that instead of being teachers, these individuals have to go back and repeat first grade. They were like children who had previously made progress in their reading, and they had chucked it for a while, and as a result of their disinterest and their thoughtlessness, they had actually forgotten the alphabet. And at their best, they could only go over the same old basic stuff. Their diet by this time, he says, should have been solid food, the kind of mature information that is necessary to grow to maturity. But instead of them being able to take solid food, all they could do was take this diet of baby food over and over again. So instead of what was obscure becoming clear, that which had previously been clear was becoming obscure. It's a sad thing to witness individuals who have never grown up, either physically or emotionally or mentally. It's also very sad to see individuals who have never grown up spiritually. Laziness has led to ignorance, and apathy has led to infancy. Now, you see, the real danger in this is As verse 12 of chapter 6 says, we don't want you to become lazy like this. We don't want you to do that because if you become lazy like this, it is a short step from there to spiritual oblivion. There's something very endearing about seeing a baby take its milk. Something really bizarre about a mature gentleman sitting sucking on a baby's bottle. You may have done that as a grandpa for a joke with your grandchildren. If you have a little bit of a sense of humor, and what do they say to you? They say, oh, Grandpa, don't do that. Don't do that, Grandpa. Look at what Grandpa's doing. Grandpa's sucking on Susie's bottle. Look, because you look such a clown. And even the children know this is ridiculous. Grandpas don't suck on these bottles. Grandpas did that when they were wee, but Grandpas are big and old and gray and baldy, and they don't do that because they've gone from there to maturity. You don't have the senior citizens ministry in the, K, in, in the, in the zero through six months room. By their indolence, says John Brown, the neglect of proper nourishment, they had spoiled their spiritual appetite. They had spoiled the power of digestion, and they had brought themselves to a state of second childhood. Do you realize that that can happen? This is not a sort of mythological concern. This is a reality. These people had their own eating disorder that they had developed. They were spiritually anorexic. 
They could be surrounded by the best of meals, and then only they would pick at their food. And they would only eat mush. And they would go back to the same old thing. Rice Krispies and toast. Rice Krispies and more toast. And when all else fails, Rice Krispies and toast. Say, how do you know about that? Because I like Rice Krispies and toast. I just had a conversation with my wife in between the services, and she told me, she said, you're not having any more of that Rice Krispies and toast routine. Because I was suggesting that I didn't need lunch and, and we would be fine. And she said, no, you have to eat. You must eat. That's what the writer's saying. You've got to eat, folks. Otherwise, you'll just be big babies. You can't live on the milk. It's okay to like milk. It's good to have it as a part of our diet. But these individuals had never got beyond that stage. And consequently, they were unable to grapple with the implications of genuine Christian experience. That's verse 13. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. He doesn't know the right thing to do under God. He is not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. Since they haven't got beyond the ABCs themselves, these individuals cannot seriously hope to be an encouragement to others in the things of faith. In fact, the opposite will be true. If you hang around with babies and with infantile conversation, you have to accommodate yourself to them. Isn't that what happens with babies? Why is it that people put their heads into prams and go, oochie coochie doodly doo can you can you? What is that? They're talking baby talk. Why? Because they're with babies. You don't go put your head in a in a crib and go, hey, can you spell anti disestablishmentarianism? <laughs> He's met by a blank stare. You put your head and you go, coochie doochie boogly, all that stuff. It's baby talk. You hang around with spiritual babies, all you can do is talk baby talk. And the level of our Christian pilgrimage will largely be determined by the level of the people with whom we hang. So we either hang with people who are urging us to press on to love and to good deeds, or we'll hang around with spiritual babies. And as long as you hang with spiritual babies, you won't feel bad about being a baby yourself. Because after all, if everyone in the restaurant is drinking on the big bottle of milk, it'll feel fine to drink on the big milk bottle. But if you're sitting with people who are tucking into a nice steak, you're going to feel like a bit of an idiot going... The churches are full all across America. You can fill service after service after service if you're content to produce a congregation of milk drinkers. Because you just go, right, fine, okay, next battery in, bring them in, give them a little more. But if you teach solid food, it's only for the mature and the babies get left behind. That's the problem then of spiritual infancy. We could say more about it, but we shouldn't. Let's go on then to the pathway to spiritual maturity. Verse 14, solid food is for the mature. There is a life cycle here. There's a kind of food chain, if you care. And this is how it goes. A person embraces faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes a baby Christian. She becomes a baby Christian. As a baby Christian, she learns the elementary truths. She then puts them into practice. She begins to grow in spiritual discernment. She is then able to take on more solid food, and then she proceeds to spiritual maturity, and then she is able to teach others. First of all, infancy, the elementary instruction, growth, and so on. Now, this is the encouragement of these words. Let's go on, he says. Let's leave behind, and let's go on to maturity. The beginning is a beginning, but it's just a beginning. It's a starting point. It's a launching pad. First and second grade is important. The alphabet is important. Past, present, and future tense is very important in the syntax of language. Two and two is four is a very important thing. Binary numbers are important to learn. All of that stuff is vital, but it's all foundational. People use it every day in their lives, but they don't make reference to it, and they don't build shrines to it, and they don't seek to impress their neighbors and their friends by referring to it. Not if they're sensible, they don't. 
So it's not that the foundations are unimportant. They're very important. But it is that we are not to be constantly footering about with the foundations and laying the foundations. You see some people who say they're going to build their own house, and you look at it, and you've, and you've been in the neighborhood for seven and nine years, and it's got weeds growing out everywhere, and there's just about two courses of bricks sticking above the ground. And every so often on a miserable Saturday, you drive by, and there's some poor soul digging around in the foundations. And then nothing happens for three months, and you go by again, and there it is again. And you want to roll the window down and say, are you ever going to get beyond the foundations? I mean, are you going to make a career about fiddling around here? The foundations are very important. We should take time with them. But once in, we move on. He says that's exactly what we need to do. What does he mean here, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and faith in God and instructions about baptisms, etc.? I think that what he means is simply this, that all of these are elements which mark essential foundational truth regarding what it means to know love, and follow Jesus. So, for example, what is the first word of the gospel? When Jesus begins to preach, what is the first word out of his mouth? Repent. Repent and believe the good news, he says. So, repentance is a vital foundational truth. Repentance is also a daily experience. Once we have grasped that, we are to live in the light of it. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in Him, relying upon Him, is foundational, and then we build upon it. Baptism is foundational. The laying on of hands was a symbol of the receiving of the Holy Spirit and of being incorporated into the church. The resurrection was the foundational news given to the new believer that death is not the end, but Jesus is alive from the dead, and therefore when we die, we will go before God, we will face judgment, and we will be welcomed into his presence. All of these are the foundational truths. Now he said, we build on these things, but we don't stay there. Foundations are meant to be built upon. That's a practical reminder from Alistair Begg as he continues our study in the book of Hebrews on Truth for Life. Every day at Truth for Life, we work hard to provide clear, relevant Bible teaching, like the message you've heard today, and to make it available to people all around the world as they grow in faith and in effectiveness for God's kingdom. But none of these messages would ever make it outside the walls of Parkside Church in Cleveland, Ohio, if it weren't for the generosity of listeners like you. Thank you for your support. So when you give today, we want to express our thanks with a 31-day devotional titled, Anxiety, Knowing God's Peace. This devotional is written by Paul Taujus, and he writes from a place of personal experience as well as professional expertise. He offers help and hope to anyone who struggles with anxiety. In our contemporary world, it's more common than we realize. And what's the solution? Well, this book explains how we start at the very beginning by identifying the source of our fear and then finding the key to release it, finally discovering the joy that comes from lasting peace with God. You'll want to request your copy of the Anxiety Devotional when you give today at truthforlife.org slash donate or call 888-588-7884. And with the weekend just ahead, don't forget Alistair's teaching at Parkside Church is streamed live most Sundays. If you'd like to find out if Alistair is teaching this weekend, you can check the schedule at truthforlife.org slash live. I'm Bob Lapine for Alistair Begg and all of us at Truth For Life, hoping you get a chance to rest a little bit this weekend. And then join us Monday as we continue learning how to grow in faith. Today's program was furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.